Hey, we understand about winning and losing, and uh, thought I'd throw a little bone out to you Cubs fans that put out a W, uh, right? If you don't know about that tradition with Chicago Cubs baseball fans, they'll fly the W flag when they win. Not the L so much, right, when they lose. True fans do, right? Uh, Kurt, you put out the L? Okay, good. No? No, okay. So, uh, Anyway, this sets up to where I'm going about winning. We know about winning. Every single person here and over at Center Grove, uh, I know that you're tuned in right now over at Center Grove Church, and um, uh, you too know about winning. And by the way, Center Grove, as soon as I'm done here, I am going to make my way over uh, there. We have an important meeting, uh, right? I'll get there at noon as soon as possible. I'll I'll get there. So uh, we know about winning. We know about what? We know about keeping score, okay? That's how to determine it, right? We know about keeping score and counting things, whether it's uh, runs that cross the plate, whether it's touchdown points and extra points, whether it's bowling pins and how many we knock down, or whether it's strokes on the golf course, or whether it's points in euchre, right? We know about counting and adding up and determining who wins, right? We know about winning. When we know that when we first figure out Who killed Colonel Mustard in the dining room with the candlestick? We know we've won the game of Clue. You still with me, church? Say yes. We know about winning, and it's fun. I've never been afraid to say that winning's fun, and some of you that know me know I I can be somewhat competitive sometime. Is that fair to say? Alec, somewhat? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I try to keep that under control. Um, but like many of you, um, uh, I think winning's fun, and uh, and I'm not afraid to say that it makes us smile. We enjoy it, and um, and I remember when I was the first year I coached high school football many years ago. I was down in Southern Iowa and took a break from being a pastor and was uh, a, a counselor, and then I coached some. Uh, uh, varsity uh, athletics and I coached high school football for the East Union Eagles and um, in one season we lost our first five games and a few of those games we got 50 pointed do y'all know what that means like the mercy rule like uh, the other team got 50 points we had zero and and I remember coach Bryson uh, my, my friend to this day Bryson's like uh, you know someone once said that losing builds character but you know we've got enough character to choke a horse right now we we're, we're, we're okay. We got it. We are we are characters right now. We're losers. Okay. So winning, you know, I get it, and I and I'll say again, winning winning is is fun. Okay. Even if you consider yourself a non-competitive person, I think it's fair to say that most everybody listening to me right now, you would prefer, you would rather you win the game if you're playing a game. You would rather you, your side wins an election. You'd rather win in life. You'd rather do that than lose. We know that in our culture that, you know, nobody wants to be a loser. Is that fair? Say yes. Nobody wants to be known as a loser. We'd rather be known as winners, okay? And that doesn't make us bad, Okay. Being a winner in our culture and in our world is positive. It's valued. It's recognized and it's rewarded in our world. Okay? And that concept of winning is attractive. And it just is. It's, it's attractive. Okay? So, like, I did a quick search this week when I was putting, pull, doing research, pulling notes together. And I went to Amazon Books, which was like the original. Uh, they started as a bookstore. And, um, you know, I used to get a lot of books from Amazon. I like to get them from the bricks and mortar now if I can. But point is that I did a quick search on self-help books with the word win or winning in the title. And, and, and the first search was over 500 Over 500, how to win in the stock market, how to win in the workplace, how to win at life, winning now, winning later, winning on purpose, winning uh, uh, in your love life. I mean, there's all these books. Point is that that they know, they know that this concept of winning is powerful and it's attractive and there's nothing evil about it. I want you to hear that, okay? But where we got to go deeper is understanding the measure or the marks. Who gets to decide that? Who gets to define and decide what winning is? Now, obviously, in sports, I'll go back to this. Obviously, um, it's counted and it's clear who has who has the most points, right? In elections, who just got the most electoral votes, the most popular votes, right? Um, uh, we keep score. Uh, what's the House, uh, U.S. House look like, and the Senate and the governors? All that stuff. So it's clear who won and who didn't, right? It's, it's like sports are easy. When I coached, I also had the privilege of coaching girls basketball, uh, high school girls basketball. I coached girls basketball the first year that they went from six on six to five on five. 
Okay, some of you in here today, you played girls basketball. Raise your hand if you're girls basketball players. Janet, Sandra, I know you did. Okay, Jen, you played. You played. Okay. Um, so that first year was tough because I had some some of the girls that would be like like kind of crying. Not all of them, but they're like. They couldn't make free throws, basically, which just was my pet peeve. Like, well, you got to make free throws. It's free. It's a free throw. Okay. They're like, coach, I was a guard. I'm like, no excuse, right? And if you don't know what that means, is that those young women, those girls had played a defense on half the court. And suddenly they had to run the full court and they were expected to put the leather ball through the iron hoop and the team that gets more balls through the hoop wins. You still with me, church? Say yes. Sports, we get it. There's an easy way to find out who's winning and who isn't, okay? But beyond games and elections, who defines is my question. Who has the measure of success and defines it uh, that you're winning and successful or, or losing? I'll go back to the self-help books. In my mind, as I looked at some of these, and I'm familiar not just with self-help books, but seminars and, and workshops, both in person and online, about winning, it comes down to this. Not all, but many of them come down to this. Here's the sign that you're winning. You get what you want. Does that make sense? Here's the sign. Here's the definition of winning. Everything, you get everything your way, right? Have it your way. You deserve, okay? You're the center of your universe. When your goals are met, when you get what you want, you're winning, okay? And, and that's, that's just a fact. I was doing some other reading, and I came across something that this pastor, Pastor Brandon Young from down south, I can't remember, remember his church, but I remember, remember what he said, and I give him credit. Because he said, quote, that our culture, our culture says that there are five Ps, five P words, five things, five attitudes and actions, five measures that you're winning and he defined these as power and as position prestige pleasure and prosperity and 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 pastor brandon said the the attractiveness of having all five of these the attractiveness of having of winning you know having all five of these going on in our lives drives us it drives us in our attitudes, in our actions. Now, we know and talk about uh, often belief drives behavior. On Wednesday nights with the confirmation class, uh, the doctrine class I'm doing with high school youth and with the adults that are coming in to say, what do we believe? What do we believe here in our church, here in, in our Global Methodist Church? This last week, we talked about salvation. What do we believe that that means? Is it only about going to heaven? No, it's about being saved from being disconnected from God in this life. We talked about purgatory. Do we believe that or not? No, we don't. But point is, I always bring it back to how does what we believe about baptism, the Lord's Supper, about, about salvation, how does that drive what we do? When it comes to the five Ps, you see, uh, if you believe that when you have lots of power and you have a great position, which has a lot of prestige, and if you have more pleasure than you have uh, a discomfort, if you have great prosperity, if you believe that, that these five Ps are a sign that you're winning, then that means, if that belief, that means you're going to be driven to have all five of those in abundance. And just to make sure we're like on the same page, power, you know, power. We just came to an election. You know, elections are one area, one area that, that they're about power. Who has it? Who doesn't? Okay? Because if you have power, one of the big things you have is a C word, and that's control. If you are in power, that means you get to choose. You get to direct. You get to have authority over decisions and people. You're in control. So some, for some people, when they get to a point where they've got some power, the, the world says, and they believe, I'm winning now. And related to power is prestige, meaning respect, admiration, some fame, right? Some fame goes with, I have some prestige. It goes along with power, right? With your, posi or with your position um, is, is when you have a, a position, that's one of the other P words, where you're at the top and you have power and you have control, you have authority over other, other people, that can bring prestige. You know, many people are searching for prestige. They're searching for admiration. They're searching to be, to be famous, to be admired, and they do that on social media. You're all aware of that, aren't you? How many likes did my post get? 
Did it go viral? Was it shared? How many times? Many people find a sense of prestige from that as well as power. Then there's the pursuit of pleasure. And then if you have more pleasure in your life, you're winning. Meaning, if, it, meaning pleasure, meaning no inconveniences. I don't have really hardly any inconveniences to me. I get what I want, when I want it, with who I want. Everything, for the most part, goes my way, and I have tons of time and money for leisure. And to, again, do what I want, when I want, how I want to do it, that's pleasurable, right? And that's winning, according to our culture. And, of course, prosperity speaks for itself. Is that our culture certainly has said, here's the measure of success. Here's the measure of how to measure yourself or how other people will measure you how prosperous are you? Do you have lots of money in your checking account, your bank account, your Venmo account? Do you have lots of money in your retirement accounts? Do you have a nice big house in an upscale neighborhood? Do you have lots of stuff, the latest and the greatest technology? Do you have new cars? Do you have trendy clothes? Do you go on vacations and all around the world that are just amazing, which again can give you prestige because you post them on Facebook and people go, wow, you are something, right? Our culture says that means you're winning you've got lots of stuff again all five of these p's is what the world says that's what you need to look for that's what you need to pursue this is what you need to have your eye on right that gold cup i'm going to grab it power position prestige pleasure prosperity but as you can guess and you already know jesus has a different opinion about this is that jesus has a different list of things as a measure of success. Jesus has a, a list that comes from him sitting down and looking at his uh, uh, immediate followers, but this, this message that he gave was repeated. It was repetition. It was saying, look, here's how to win in my kingdom, says Jesus. Here's how to win, okay? The word he's going to use, you're going to read this, it comes from Matthew 5, 1 through 12, if you've got your Bibles with you. Some of you maybe already know what this is, okay? It's, it's the be attitudes. It's the attitudes and actions that you need to be, that you need to have, that you need to strive for, that you need to grow in. It's Jesus' word saying, pay attention to how you relate to other people. Pay attention to how you relate to God. Your attitudes and your actions. And I'm going to read it to you and you can follow along. Jesus said, here's how, here's how not only you will be known as my people, um, as, as my brothers and sisters, but here's how the world will know when you are blessed, when you, you're winning, when you're poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called, called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me says jesus rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you jesus talked about a reward he talked about being blessed about about a reward from god not from the world that's key and you can translate that, I believe, into winning. But let's unpack this a little bit because you see, at the end of my time talking here this morning, I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to challenge you to go back to Matthew 5 and find just one. Find just one of these attitudes and actions that you need to work on in your life. That you need to work on in your life to win, according to Jesus, not the world. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay? What does that mean? Well, it might be easy, you know, on the face of it to say, blessed are those who, who are just kind of, of meek. Well, he talks about that in another place. People are just kind of uh, uh, quiet, right? You, you know, don't say much. That's not what he means at all. In Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, poor people begged. Poor people had their hands out. In Jesus' day, poor people had to be dependent upon other people so they could survive, Okay? So to understand this, Jesus says in spirit, maybe not in material goods, maybe not in, in, in wealth, but in spirit, 
You need to have your hands out to God and say, God, I need you. God, I am dependent upon your Holy Spirit and your energy. I'm dependent upon your forgiveness. I'm dependent upon your love. I'm like, like, like a kid, like a kid during December that, that go, used to be go through the paper catalog. Now they go online. And the kids, God bless them. He said, let the children come to me. Children believe their parents and grandparents are going to give them everything they ask for. Amen? And they ask, and that's, it doesn't mean they're bad, okay? It means that they still have that innocence about them, but more than that, that dependence and trust upon their parents and their family to say, my hands are open, Mom, Dad, Grant, will you please fill them? Jesus says to be poor in spirit is to win because you're saying, I'm dependent upon you, Lord. I'm dependent upon you for everything. Jesus says, if that's your attitude, you're winning. If you are poor in the spirit of the age, I just talked about the spirit of the age says you need to be rich in these things. Jesus says, those who are poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is yours, okay? He goes on and he says, blessed are those who mourn. Now on the one hand saying, <clears throat> so, so you're rewarded by God when you can be sad and grieve for somebody else besides yourself. That makes sense, doesn't it? That's a sign that says you're not just selfish and all about yourself, but it's deeper than this, okay? What I believe Jesus is saying to us is blessed, blessed, excuse me, I went into the King James Version for a moment. Blessed are those who recognize, are conscious of, and are sad when they realize that they are far away from God. Blessed are those, winning are those who, who recognize and who mourn when their sin has disconnected them from God because that kind of recognition, that kind of attitude uh, leads to the action of uh, confessing your sin to God, putting you on the path to be forgiven, to be assured, uh, and to grow. Blessed are those who mourn their disconnection from God for they will be comforted by God, meaning they will be forgiven of their sin. They'll be comforted. They'll be assured. Jesus said, blessed, blessed are the meek. You're winning when you're meek. Again, does this mean being a doormat? Does it mean being pushed around? Does it mean that kind of, you know, uh, 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 passiveness, right? Not, 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 not fear, you know, being fearful, trembling, don't want to leave the house, the meek, the weak. No. You know, I had to dig deep on this one. Like, what's he saying? Jesus said, you're going to win when you're meek, right? And what I came to, in, 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 like in the Greek, and I'm not going to get into the Greek, but, but what, what it said to me was strength under control is what Jesus meant. And I'm going to unpack that. When you have strength, like on our banners, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. When I have that confidence that I belong to God and that God's spirit is, is strengthening me and, and will carry me and will help me. When I have that confidence, when I have that confidence um, that, that I belong to God and I'm good with God, then I don't need to be a bully. And I don't need to be, I don't need to be arrogant. I can be confident. Some of you know that's something that sometimes I've been accused of through the years, uh, you know, uh, when I lead the church man, that guy's arrogant. And some people have defended me and I've defended myself and said, no, I'm not, I'm arrogant, I'm, I'm confident. I have a strength that comes from God, not me, but God in me. And I believe that God has called me to do a job and equipped me to do it. And I've covered it with lots of prayer and I'm confident, but I do, my sin is that I need to keep it under control sometimes. Fair enough, okay? Um, I, I just had that with the, the funeral home, with this big funeral. You know, I explained to them, I always work great with funeral homes, but I was a little uptight, I was a little on edge, and I said, look, I'm heavily invested in this funeral for this family. I want to get it right, okay? And I want to do it a certain way. Well, they wanted to do it a different way. I said, no, I want to do it this way. No, we want to do it this way. And I had to finally play that card. Man, I hated it. Hey, you're in my house. You'll play by my rules, Right? Now that's a little bit arrogant. That's a little bit out of control is what I'm confessing to you. Be meek, okay? Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be self-righteous. Don't be a bully. Be strong in the Lord, but be under control. Be meek, and you're going to be winning, right? You're going you're gonna to win. Jesus said hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said you're going to win. You're going to win, and God's going to bless you when you have a passion to be right with God. 
When your belief that you need to be right and connected with God, that's going to drive a behavior that you're hungry, you're thirsty for it. Now look, from the time we come out, came out of our mother's wombs, we know when we get hungry, when we're thirsty, we are driven. As babies, we cry, right? That's how God created us. That's how we're hardwired, right? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm driven. I hunger and thirst for food, for milk, for water, whatever we know that in our own lives. Jesus says, when you have that same kind of hunger, when you have that same kind of passion to be right with God and to know Jesus and the ways of Jesus and to be in God's presence, just like when you're hungry, you go get something to eat. You're thirsty, you go get some water. Jesus says, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be winning. When you hunger and thirst, when you're highly motivated to be right with God and to be good with God and be in the presence of God. I realize, you know, that, um, you know, observation is it, is it sadly, uh, we know that some people are close to death when they aren't hungry or thirsty anymore. Do you all know what I'm talking about? It's a natural thing and it happens. Some people that are dying and are close to death, they stop eating. They're not hungry. And they stop drinking. And it's just a matter before they shut down. Jesus said, you're winning when you're hungry and thirsty for me, is what he said, and to be right with God. Jesus said, you're winning when you're merciful. When you can extend mercy. Meaning, when you can be graceful. You can be compassionate. You can be forgiving. Even to those people you don't like. Even to the people that aren't like you. Even to the people who don't look like you or smell like you or vote like you or dress like you. Jesus says, extend mercy. Even to people who have hurt you and harmed you. Even to people who have offended you. Be graceful. Be compassionate. Be forgiving. Jesus, in effect, is saying, be me. Jesus, on the cross, crucified, after being beaten. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus said, be merciful. Right? Give your time, your attention, your prayers, your presence to those people that have offended you as well as the people who are lost and who are broken and who are grieving. Jesus says, instead of being judgmental, instead of being on your high horse, right? Instead of being arrogant, Pharisee, self-righteous, mercy. Mercy. Because, you know, God does know this. Is it, is it we like mercy? I like being forgiven. I like that God uh, uh, is compassionate towards me even when I don't deserve it. Anybody else understand what I'm saying? Okay. You know, a personal thing. My prayer is usually first thing in the morning, especially if it's been a long day, a hard day, right? Or I know I haven't been my best self. Literally before my feet hit the floor, floor Lord, have mercy on me today. Lord, have mercy and forgive me and help me today. So, you know, maybe you practice that because Jesus said when you, when you can practice mercy, you will receive mercy from God, forgiveness, compassion, all that. Jesus said, blessed are those who are pure in heart. Does that mean you're winning when your heart is perfect, when you're sinless? Well, no, all sin falls short of the glory of God. Understand what this means. Jesus is talking about an undivided heart. See, it's easy for us to be kind of in, kind of in to being a Christian, like on Sundays or when it's convenient or when we're in trouble, right? When we're in trouble, um, it's, it's easier to, to be, for, for God to have our undivided attention when we're hurting, when, when we're anxious, when, when we've messed up so bad that nobody will talk to us, right? We, we may have a real undivided heart, but man, the rest of the time, our hearts aren't pure. Our hearts not only sin, but our hearts are worried about winning in all these other areas. Jesus says, look, you get your heart taken care of. You have, a, 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 you have an undivided heart, and you're all in, not kind of in, not sometimes in, but you're all in to me, says Jesus. Undivided, when you're devoted, committed to God, you're winning. And you're going to see God. That's what you're going to win. You're going to win that. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. The first thing that came to my mind is Jesus said, blessed winning. You're winning when you're a peacemaker instead of being a troublemaker. Does that make sense? And I mean, he's talking specifically, I believe, in the church or in your family or in your workplace or in your community. As I read this and says, Jesus is saying, blessed are the people who are working to end 
and bring about resolution to conflicts and brokenness and fighting and division as opposed to the people that are working and causing conflict and division and drama. You know anybody like that? That they just seem to be like, like a pig pen in the, in, the, in the Snoopy Charlie Brown cartoon that walk around with the cloud over their head? There's some people like just can't help themselves, whether it's in their workplace, their family, their extended family, or even their church, is that they just have this need to cause drama and division and conflict, okay? And in effect, Jesus looks at them and says, that's not winning. You may think you're winning something for yourself, but you're losing. Winning is being a peacemaker and being used as an instrument of God's peace to resolve conflict and brokenness and fighting and sin. Peace. Jesus says, bless you when you're persecuted for righteousness. When you're persecuted for standing up for me. When you're persecuted for knowing me. Here in the United States, seldom are we persecuted because we have Bibles in our homes or we worship. Our persecution in our secular culture comes in different ways. Is that many people are persecuted when they make decisions or take stands through the, through the eyes of faith or through standing on a, an interpretation of scripture that they believe and they take a stand on it. And they say, no, I can't do that. I can't support that. I can't go there. I can't do that. And so for many of these people in our North American culture, and I think our latest election just exposed that, there are people saying, I've had enough of that, okay? I am unashamedly unafraid to be a Christian in the public square, okay? And if you need to call me stupid, if you need to call me dumb, if you need to make fun of me, if you need to say that I'm an idiot, that I'm not smart enough, I'm backwards, I'm a racist, sexist, homophobic, a bigot, if you need to persecute me like that, I think there's more and more people saying, fine, bring it. Amen? Amen. Jesus says, you're winning if your stand for faith means that people gossip about you don't like you marginalize you make fun of you jesus says when you're persecuted because of your christian faith specifically that not your political affiliation when when you are persecuted because of jesus jesus says yours is the kingdom of heaven all these that jesus has listed persecution peacemakers pure in heart merciful those who mourn, those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus said all of these in his kingdom, in his attitude. Jesus says, you have these, you're winning. The world won't say you're winning. They may say you're losing, but Jesus says, no, no, you're winning, right? And the things that you win in the winner's platform with Jesus, according to him, is entrance and membership into the kingdom of heaven part of the family of God, the children of God. You will see and experience God. You will, you will win, right? By being filled with the Holy Spirit of God and filled with strength and filled with comfort and receiving the mercy of God and being blessed with an abundance of what you need. Jesus says winning in his world is different than what our world says is winning. Again, I'm gonna encourage you, if you're brave enough, take time. Go through Matthew 5, the first part of the B attitudes. And decide which one you need the most help with. Which one, which one is maybe an area right now that's lacking? Does God need to help you be a peacemaker? Does God need to help you stand up in your family, in your workplace, in your church, and help resolve conflict? To help put a, 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 you know, a stay on consumer mentality that says, I want what I want when I want it in my church. Do you need to be a peacemaker? Do you need to be a, 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 have a pure heart and not be so divided and conflicted? Do you need, do you need to be merciful to somebody that, that you're mad at, angry at, you want a retribution? Whatever it is, I invite you with the help of God's Holy Spirit to help you, to strengthen you. Because I know that you, like me, I want to win. I want to win in Jesus' kingdom and his world. So may God help us. Let me pray for us. Lord God, you do know us as we are and who we are. You know what we struggle with. You know with the kinds of things that trip us up, the kinds of things, Lord, that hurt us. But more than that, Lord, you know the kinds of attitudes and actions we have that hurt other people and that hurt you and grieve you. 
I pray, Lord God, that you help us this week to grow, to be intentional, to be thoughtful, to be aware of where we desperately need your strength and your help. I pray this for all of us, and all of us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we say out loud, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.